I walked into that class and did everything wrong you could do. And I remember the instructor walked in and he was like, and you are? And I'm like, yeah, I'm here to learn karate. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, what? And I remember everybody like taking a step away from me as I said this. <laughs> like they were just like, we want nothing to do with this chick at all. And he was just like, uh, you need to go stand down at the end with the white belts. And I remember looking down, there was like two or three kids there and they were even higher ranked. They were like blue belts. And I was like, yeah, the kids are down there. I'm an adult. And he was like, come with me. And I just remember the look on his face was so evil. And he's like, come here. Welcome to GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, a.k.a. the Going North Podcast, where authors from around the world help you realize that success is tangible. You'll leave with at least one new piece of inspiration or information to help you keep going north. Now let's get on with the show. Before this episode starts, just want to highlight another review that came in, baby! And this one's all the way from Bulgaria. And it's a short review too, a five-star review titled, INSPIRING! All capital letters with two exclamation points indeed. And his review is an inspiring show with a great focus and topics. Thanks a bunch, Anthony Shagan, for leaving a wonderful review about the show. And if you too want a shout out on the podcast for leaving a review, do so by heading over to goingnorthpodcast.com or Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a great review about the show indeed. And we'll be sure to highlight it before an episode starts indeed. And in speaking of an episode starting, let's start off with today's interview. And today on the High Live Real Builder for Authors, known as GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, is the Going North podcast. And we got another super special, awesome human that can fit all three of those G's and more because courtesy of the wonderful site with all the microphones on fire, podmatch.com, where podcast guests get to meet podcast hosts. And if the guests are cool, they're freaking in. And today's guest is cooler than three cucumbers indeed because we got one heck of a guest for you today because she's an award-winning author, y'all. That's right, indeed, an award winning author for her super special awesome fantasy novels and not only that she's also a martial artist as well and if i'm not mistaken she's probably got at least one black belt minimum because she studied multiple and she's also a cosplayer indeed who does a bang up job at cosplaying indeed so to say your everyday cosplay y'all she takes it to level 99 so let's give it up for fellow d the delightful and observant the one and only danielle orsino how you doing today danielle Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm ready to throw down with you and talk a little, dish a little, get it all in. Oh, yeah, that's right. Indeed, that's right. Indeed, that's right. For those listening to the audio, she is in full garb, full regalia. That's right. Indeed, full queen mode. That's right. Indeed, full queen mode. Indeed, that's right. Indeed, Ty TR is on the head, so we know what time it is. Of course. I got to serve just a little bit, you know, I got to come as the queen of the fae. <laughs> there we go. The fabulous, angelic and energetic, I'm assuming. <laughs> just a little, you know, it's Friday. I got to bring it. We got to get ready for the weekend here. Even the fae are ready for Friday. <laughs> there you go. Fae Friday. <laughs> fae Friday. That's your new thing. Fae Friday. Ah, uh, but hey, my goodness, as with all introductions, they're not allowed to be 17 and a half days long. And it's your first ever appearance on the show. So I usually like to get a bit of the backstory for the folks listening around the globe. So my feeling is a bit in on how you became the delightful Danielle that you are today. Uh, I came out of the womb this way with a crown on top of my head. But besides that, I started off as an author. I was a nurse first. And then I met a patient who needed a little distraction. And so I told him a story and little did I know it would explode into the series Birth of the Fae. And, uh, you know, the universe had another plan for me and it decided to take me out of healthcare and turn me into an author. And uh, I took my love of cosplay and combined it with writing. And this is what you have before you. 
a fae with a crown on top of her head writing books about the fae. Ah, uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. So indeed, sweet. So if I'm not mistaken, funny enough, you had this creativity <laughs> since you were younger as in like probably crawling because if i'm not mistaken before <laughs> you're about to go to or close to medical school you actually designed your own nurse stuff and based off of wonder woman right yeah i did yeah i went to my nursing school graduation we were allowed i went to my i shouldn't say we were allowed i went to one of my instructors and said um instead of those nursing school uniforms that you want me to go buy in the uh uniform store I'm like, can I make mine? And she was like, well, it's it's got to be the standard, blah, blah, blah. And then I pulled out a comic book and I went, can I wear this? And it was Wonder Woman. And she was like, oh my God, Danielle. And I was like, but it's standard. I was like, technically, <laughs> this is a 1940s uniform. And she finally just looked at me. She went, whatever. She's like, Danielle, just, just show it to me. And I had designed it, made it, brought it into her. And I was like, can I wear this? And she looked at me. She was like, just whatever. Just, she's like, yeah, that's, that's fine she's like whatever and then I'm like oh and the shoes because we were supposed to wear like the nurse's shoes like the soldier I was like um I'm gonna go to a navy like army navy supply store and get I got like the grad wedge shoes like the nice ones and I showed up in that and I was dressed to the nines darn straight I was like I'm, I'm doing this out yeah I went in looking just like Wonder Woman right from the comic book and they I put me on the website after that and then they put it in all the contracts that you have to actually buy your uniform from the stores after that. So um, wow. nobody was able to repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, we can't do this again. <laughs> like, we just can't. <laughs> Mrs. Hollander was done. I gave that woman gray hair. She was like, never again. We're done. <laughs> and they put it in the contracts after that. But uh, yeah, I did do that. Yeah. No, I, did. Uh -huh. I still have my uniform. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there were people there that was like, how did she get that? And I was like, yeah, well, you know. But uh -huh. yeah, I yeah, I might have done that. <laughs> love that. Just love that. <laughs> there you go. Hashtag superb creativity, especially when you get to make it yourself. <laughs> you know, it was one of those gotta stand out. Why blend when you can stand out, even in nursing, you know. That's right indeed. That's right. Especially when some random bunnies come out of nowhere and be like, hello, nurse. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, indeed. you know, it was a little Animaniacs moment. I had to do something. <laughs> Let's live it up, you know? I was it was a nine month accelerated program. I was in school by eight AM and then, you know, it we it was it was rough. And I was like, Well, we started out with ninety nine of us and I think only fifty nine graduated and made it through the program. Wow. And I was valedictorian. I'm like, you know what? I'm going up there. I earned this. So I'm gonna look cute. I'm going to look fabulous. I'm going to look cute. So that's how we're doing it. If I'm going to look like Wonder Woman, so be it. It all comes uh, back to Wonder Woman. Uh, heck yeah, indeed. That's what I'm talking about, indeed. And speaking of Wonder Woman, you also are a martial artist, indeed. So my goodness, so did your parents put you in martial arts classes, or did you discover that, like, in your later teen years? Like, how did that all come to be? Uh, no, I discovered that later on. I was probably about 18, 19. And I wanted to go to New Orleans. I never went on spring break or did any of that. And uh, my best friend from high school, you know, we were reading Anne Rice novels and the whole vampire thing. So we decided we want to go take a tour of New Orleans. And my dad was like, you think I'm letting my daughter go to New Orleans with her best friend from sixth grade? <laughs> He's like, the trouble that you two could get into? He's like, um, no. He's like, so here's the deal. You can go if you earn your yellow belt in Taekwondo because he knew the gym that I went to had a Taekwondo program. So he's like, yeah, you get your yellow belt and I'll let you go because he's thinking there is no way she's doing this. And I was like, deal. And we shook on it. And I was like, I'm going to go get my yellow belt. And I walked into that class and did everything wrong you could do. I had a crop top on. I think I just had a sports bra on. I uh, had low slung, you know, sweatpants, makeup on my face, chewing gum, walked in front of a black belt and stood with them at the end of the line, hand on my hip, chewing gum. Like typical, just, you know, sat there. And I remember the instructor walked in and he was like, and you are? And I'm like, yeah, I'm here to learn karate. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, what? And I remember everybody like taking a step away from me as I said this. <laughs> Like they were just like, we want nothing to do with this chick at all. And my best friend was with me 
And he asked us a, a couple like self-defense questions and everything Jen answered was, I'll have a gun. I'd get a gun. And I'm just, and he was just like, he looked at her like, mm. I don't even want to talk to you, but you. And I was like, and you are. And he's like, I'm Mr. McLaughlin. And I was like, John, right? Like that's your name or something. And he was just like, uh, you need to go stand down at the end with the white belts. And I remember looking down, there was like two or three kids there and they were even higher rank. They were like blue belts. And I was like, yeah, the kids are down there. I'm an adult. And he was like, come with me. And I just remember the look on his face was so evil. And he's like, come here. And I'm like, okay. And I just went over there, just like the whole L Woods, like whatever kind of thing. And he walked me to the back of the class and it was um, like a multi-purpose room, hardwood floor. And he was like, could you do a push up? Can you do one? And I went, yeah. And I don't do like girly ones on my knees. I do real ones. And he went, oh, good. And he just gave this maniacal laugh and he's like, show me. And I did one and he went, okay, can you do it on your knuckles? I was like, yeah, like it's hard. And I did one and he went, great, hold it. And I remember Jen walked out at this point. She was just done with the whole thing. She was like, yeah, I'm out of here. She's like, there's a cute guy, I'm, I'm gone. And I held it and then I kind of fell and he was like, no, 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 keep holding it. He's like, you, you just stay right there, honey. And I did, and he just walked away. And I remember looking at him like, why, why did he, what, what, huh? And he just started class and I started dropping. He went, no, 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 keep holding it. And something in me told me to hold it. Like I started getting a little scared. And then my arm started shaking. I started sweating and he came back to me and he got down face level with me. And he went, now here's how we're going to play it. He's like, um, you're going to go. You're going to wash all that makeup off your face. You're going to get a shirt that fits you. And you're going to come back in here. He said, because either you're going to leave here in a body bag or you're going to be my greatest accomplishment. He said, that's how it's going to go. You got it? And I remember going, yes. Like trying to figure out what to call him. And I was like, sensei's like, no, no, no. Sensei's Japanese. Sensei's karate. We do Taekwondo. That's Korean. He's like, I'm a sub-anim. And I was like, yes, sub. He goes, just say, sir. Just say, sir. And I was like, yes, sir. And he's like, very good. Go fast. And I went, bought a t-shirt, washed the makeup off my face, came back. And he was shocked I returned. Like I walked back in and he was like, oh crap, you came back. Like he was just like, oh. <laughs> he's, I, I remember him like looking at the assistant and trust like, this girl came back. Like what the heck? And I was like, okay. And he's like, you ready to learn? I'm like, yeah. And he taught me like a front kick, a stretch kick, and a down block. And that's all I practiced for an hour. And then I was hooked. And I paid for the first month. And I never paid again for like another eight years. And I was hooked. And that was it. So the rest is history. Jen never came back. <laughs> but <laughs> she was done. <laughs> Every now and then she'd walk by and be like, there's a cute guy over there. <laughs> you know, but she was done. But she was done in class. <sighs> That's what I'm talking about, Dade. And I guess in a way you did become his greatest accomplishment, right? <laughs> Ten years of Taekwondo and even won championships, I right? Yes, I, I competed in over 500 tournaments. Uh, I was inducted into the World Martial Art Hall of Fame by Vincent Lin was one of my sponsors in. Uh, I've competed, you know, up and down the East Coast. I was judged by Michael J. White. Wow. J. White, he was one of, he had finished Spawn. He was doing the Mike Tyson biopic when I met him. And I, he judged me in my first Underbelt Grand Championship. That was the first time I won an Underbelt Grand Championship. And it happened to be the first tournament my instructor had come to in a couple, it had been a couple years, because my instructor would only come to like one a year. Uh, if he could and that was the first one he had come to in a while and I was a red belt and uh Michael walked in and it was a shock to all of us that he was there I mean I remember just going spawns here that was like what was being whispered yeah. I'm like what and he walked in and he does a backflip and the top the top of his toes hit the bottom of the basketball net and he lands and the whole wow. gym just gets dead silent and he stands up and bows and he goes you guys don't mind if I jump in on judging, right? Wow. And everybody was like, oh my God. Like we were all like, holy. And my instructor's going, who's that? Who, who is this dude? And I'm like, shh. 
I'm like, shit, just be quiet. I'm like, just, he'll hear you. Like, he was just one of those, like, Please. and uh, he just took the center seat, bowed, and he's like, I'm going to sit on a grand champion. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to perform in front of Spawn. Like, wow. And he judged me, and I spoke to him afterwards. And we had like this great conversation because I had said, after I won, I went, what could I, what could I have done better? And he looked at me and he just cocked his head and he's like, you won. And I went, yeah, I know. I was like, what could I, and he went, and I remember putting his arm around me going, come here, sweetie, let's talk. And he's like, now that you ask, he's like, since you asked, he's like, and remember, you asked me. And I was like, (laughs) yes. And he's like, let's have a little talk. And we went walking and he gave me all this advice. And he goes, first of all, calm down. You don't take it so seriously. He's like, but once again, since you asked, he's like, let's talk. And he gave me all these different ways to stand in my intro and like give me this great advice. He was super nice. But that was like my first big, my big like underbelt grand champion. That was my first grand champion. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Now to see him go on to do all these things. I'm like, he's still a phenomenal martial artist. Like I, you know, I kind of remind people, I'm like, yeah, he's a great actor. And that's what he started out in martial arts. Like he's the real deal. So Yeah. So I kind of joke with my instructor. I'm like, all those gray hairs, totally worth it. <laughs> ah, that's right, indeed. Definitely can say that again, especially to get advice from a great one like Michael Jai White. And it's actually funny looking at him today. He doesn't look it, but he's actually a great grandfather now, which is like, wow. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> it, mm-hmm. it is crazy indeed. So my goodness, my goodness. And Funny enough, you actually met even more celebrities in your life. Was this thanks to your martial arts travels that transferred into another sphere of skills that you get to display? Like, how did that even work? Yeah, it all kind of came, a lot of it, yeah, has come from martial arts. The Rock I met doing stunt work because of Vincent Lynn when I was uh, protégéing with him. He got the WW, it was the WWF at the time, it was right before they changed over their first Super Bowl commercial with it was China, Stone Cold, The Rock, Mankind, Triple H, it was a bunch of them. They decided, you know, to do this big Super Bowl commercial at the time. I think it was the most expensive Super Bowl commercial in history, you know, which goes to show how much it's gone up now. They asked Vincent because his school was literally right down the road from the Stanford headquarters. They asked him to come in and do the stunt work. So they were talking that they needed a smaller girl. And Vincent had said i got somebody he's like hold on i got the perfect girl so he he called me and he's like and it was i think it was new year's eve that we were filming and he's like uh come here bring a suit and i'm like a suit he goes bring a black suit and he didn't even tell me what we're doing he's like just come here so it was him bobby samuels was a phenomenal stunt guy he brought it bobby brought his troop and we got there and i think it was michael du pasqual there's one other guy because he went off the roof at the end and I remember it was really cold and we couldn't film the end scene so we had to wait a day but um we got there and there were all the wrestlers and they were just waiting there and it was like this premise that the wrestlers were the calm guys and it was everybody in corporate who were the crazy people and the yeah. first day we filmed it was with the rock and they were having like an argument in the um conference room and somebody was supposed to go through the plate glass and hit the wall but they weren't supposed to hit the wall. We wound up hitting the wall. We weren't supposed to. And the rock was like walking down the hallway. So we had to keep doing these takes. And everybody who was going through the window, uh, the glass wasn't doing it right. Either the glass wasn't breaking. They were getting thrown to it. And finally, the director looked over at me. And I, the rock stepped forward and like put his hand. Because I was bugging the rock all day. I was just <laughs> bothering him to do the eyebrow thing constantly. I was like, do it again. Do it again. <laughs> and, he, and he would do it. A man would do it every time for me. And I was probably annoying the crap, but he never let on. He did it every time for me. And we were just standing there because they would reset up and he would wait. And, you know, it was taking a long time to set up the glass. So I was the only, so we were playing video games and I wasn't into wrestling. So I didn't know how big he was, you know, I was just, and, and I came up to his hips. So it was funny to see the two of us standing there. It was comical. And he mm-hmm. would just sit there and go, you're kind of small. And I'm like, you're kind of big, huh? And we you know we just <laughs> whatever, like, and he would just laugh. I'd laugh, and we'd go back to whatever, because we the Undertaker was there, and you weren't allowed to talk to him when he was in costume or he was in character. I don't know, he was in a mood. 
So The Rock was cool. Like you could talk to him. And finally they were like, it wasn't working. And so the director's eyes just slid toward me. And he went, and The Rock went, oh, no, no, no. We're not, we're not throwing the little one. Mm -mm. And then he just looked, he was like, you don't mind me stepping in, right? I was like, no, that's no, we're not throwing the little one. Like, <laughs> we're not throwing the little one. I'm good with that. He's like, yeah. Because he was just like, no, let's not throw the littlest one. Bobby stepped in. Bobby actually wound up getting hurt. He was okay. But it shut us down for a little bit. But the rock band later, he's like, don't let them talk you in. Like, don't let any point of the director. He's like, don't let him talk you into doing anything. That, like, you're not cool with. And he filmed his name. He, he said goodbye. And then he was leaving. I was like, do it one more time for me. I was like, one more time. He turned around and did the eyebrow thing. Like, I was like, cool, thanks. You know, but I, I didn't take a picture. Because I because everybody's like, do you have a picture with the rock? I'm like, I didn't know. First of all, I had no idea he was going to become Black Adam. Like, all I knew was it was a guy walking around in a Speedo with Elvis hair at the time. I didn't <laughs> right. know this guy was going to go on to become the biggest movie star in the world. I was just thinking, who told you that hair looked good? Like, that's, you know, that's what I was thinking at the time. Like, really? You're in a Speedo with, like, an open silk shirt and Elvis <laughs> hair. I, mean, I wasn't thinking, like, one day, dude, you're going to be the standard. No, I did not think this at all. You know, I'm thinking, like, do the eyebrow thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I was thinking. I met China the next day, who was so sweet to me. They... They asked her if she could like pick me up by my leg. And she was like, she looked at me, same thing. I can, once she came out in her outfit with her plat, she had six inch platform boots on. I think I just made it up to her hips. Like mm. just, I just barely. And she looked at me and they were like, can you pick her up by her leg? And she looked at me and she went, you trust me? And her jaw was wired shut. And I went, mm -hmm. and she went, okay. Like she looked at me like, I'm glad you trust me. <laughs> I don't even know why I trust me. So I laid down, she picked me up. <laughs> And they were like, no, nah, it doesn't really work. And she was like, good. Put me down nice, like gently and stuff. And they were like, no, nah, instead run through these garbage cans. They'll be on fire. And I remember her, she looked at me at my ponytail. She went, move your ponytail. And I was like, good piece of advice. Thank you, honey. Because that would have wound up on fire. Cool. And so, you know, I met Triple H. I met all of them. Mankind was probably, Nick Foles was like, Nick Foley was the nicest out of everybody. The Rock was was up there with them. They were probably the nicest out of everybody. I think China would have talked more if she could, uh, but the jaw thing made it a little more difficult. But, you know, yeah, it was all pretty much more martial arts that initially started me down that path. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about indeed. I know you love to write the fantasy novels, but you think you'll one day write a biography? Um, I don't know. A couple people have asked, and I've joked that I already have a title for it um the working title is tragically funny because that's kind of <laughs> how it all goes <laughs> but i i don't know maybe i kind of wonder like who would be interested in it uh you know besides probably a lot of martial artists who kind of go yeah i know what that feels like and short people um you know <laughs> so you know um maybe one day once i've uh I've gotten through a little bit further on the novels to see where it takes me. I think it might be interesting to do something. And then I can uh, really dish the dirt a little bit more because God knows I do have some tales to tell. So we'll <laughs> see. You know, I may, be, I may have feuded with a certain um, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills cast oh. member, Lisa Renna. Uh, you know, I, I may have, you know, had some run-ins, uh, you know, with that so yeah who knows maybe i will you never know so we'll see possibly i wouldn't rule it out completely <laughs> sweet well definitely don't rule it out indeed because i'm sure you got some interesting stories to share indeed that's right indeed that's right indeed and my goodness my goodness tragically funny the working title <laughs> funny <laughs> but not so funny is that it was probably going to be a tragedy of a fork in the road to you becoming a novel, if I'm not mistaken, right? Because there's a conflict of interest that they kind of forced upon you once you got your first writing contract. Yes, it was. Um, I was accepted into a PA program at that point, physician's assistant school. I finally got in after all the prereqs, after doing all the work, I had gotten in and I was like, I'm here, I'm going to do it. And then I had something possibly on the table from one of the big three 
publishers. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And then I read the contract from the physician assistant program, not from the contract from the publisher. And it said that you can't work. It's an employment contract. Basically you cannot work while you're in school. If the book came out during the two years that I was in school, they considered that employment. So I'm like, okay, but what if I said, if I'm not promoting and it comes out and they were like, no, no, no. If the book comes out, you're in violation. And I was like, okay, well, what does that mean? And they were like, well, it's a $30,000 fine. Your loans go into default and we can kick you out of the program. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry, what? It was one of those, I'm sorry, excuse me, could you repeat that again? And they did. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know when the book's going to come out. I said, I won't know until I sign the contract. Like, there's still a lot going on. I haven't decided. And they were like, okay, well, you can't do it while you're here because they're going to have to ask you to promote what if there's last minute edits. It's like, this is all stuff, can, you know. And I was like, okay, um, what do I do? And they said, well, we've never really had this problem. So I spoke to the head of the program and he said, look, off the record, he said, I can't promise you that there's not some doctor, some professor who didn't one day dream of being an author, who's not going to find this out and be like, oh, no, 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 and want to enforce this. He's like, and if they bring it to my attention, I'm going to have to enforce it. And I was like, okay. And I'm like, so what do I do? And he's like, if you want my advice, honey. He's like, I remember you. He's like, bright red hair. He's like, you wore a bright blue power suit to the uh, interview. I'm like, yeah, that's me. I was like, it was my Hillary moment. I thought I was being like, yeah, I was trying to stand out from the crowd, you know? And he's like, yeah. He's like, you noticed everybody was wearing black and you wore electric blue. I'm like, once again, you remember me though. He's like, yes, I do. He's like, <laughs> do yourself a favor, sweetie. Bet on red, bet on yourself. And I was like, okay. And like, I'm going to go. I did not go with that contract with that publisher, but it still taught me like, if I was going to do this, I was just going to jump in feet first. And then I had to, of course, tell my father, which was an interesting conversation. But, you know, I, uh, I decided to go the novelist route. Ah, uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. And how was it like digging yourself out of that hole <laughs> with everything going on? <laughs> yeah, that was... First of all, calling your dad and saying, I'm going to write a book about fairies and not go to medical school. That's an interesting conversation to have after you've just spent a lot of money on um, prereqs and finishing your bachelor's degree. Interesting conversation to have. Some of it was done over text out of pure fear. And then my dad called me back and he was like, I'm sorry, you're going to do what? And I was like, so dad, at first I took a picture of the acceptance letter, which said medical program, medical school. And I said, does this count as me getting into medical school? And he goes, of course it does, baby. I'm so proud of you, blah, blah, blah. And I went, great. Hold that thought and keep that in mind while I explain this to you. And he went, okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, just like, hold it, dad. And I'm like, so <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And he went, uh-huh. I said, I'm going to write a book about fairies. Okay, I love you so much, dad. Thank you, bye-bye, click. And then the phone rang back. <laughs> and I picked it up and I went, hello. He goes, you're going to do what? <laughs> and I went, okay, so let me explain. And I explained everything. And then I said, uh, if I don't, I'm in violation. And I said, by the way, med school is going to cost me $220,000. And I can't write it off anymore because of this, you know, I explained. And he went, $220,000. Huh? I go, yeah, and if the book comes out during that time, I'm in default, then I have to pay him $30,000. And, and he went, Okay, have fun writing a book about fairies. Gotta go. Love you. Bye. Click. And he hung up. So we came to a mutual understanding is how I see it. But yeah, there were some sleepless nights, especially during the pandemic when everybody was working and I would have technically have graduated early and not finished the last semester, but still graduated where I'm like, I wonder if they would have charged me for that. Yeah, there was some, you know, there was a little bit, did I make the right decision moments, but at the end of the day, I, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, or at least that's how I feel about it. So I'm going for it. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, indeed. She's going forward, indeed. That's right, indeed. 
if I'm not mistaken, going five four because you got five novels out now. If I'm not mistaken, right? I have five books. I have one novella. So yeah, I'm I'm fully in the Fey. The Fey are not getting rid of me, and I'm not getting rid of them. I'm in it. My first book is Locked Out of Heaven. Second book is Thine Eyes of Mercy. Third book, which I won the award for, is From the Ashes. Kingdom Come is number four, and number five is uh, A Fey is Done. The novella is Fire, Ice, Acid, and Heart. Sweet. That's right, indeed. A whole thumb and a half, baby. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. That five to stay alive, indeed. So, my goodness, my goodness. So, how how was it like to become a writer when you didn't go to the school for writing? You actually went to school for medical since writing wasn't your original wheelhouse. <laughs> Once again, if you want to know what not to do, come talk to me and sit next to me, and I will tell you everything that you shouldn't do and make all those mistakes. It's been a journey and a half, but uh, I've learned so much from this, so much from this experience. I still do things backward. You know, it's I'm still backwards in everything I do. I handwrite all the novels, which some people find crazy, but I, I like handwriting because I don't have to worry about technology. I always have a pen and a piece of paper. So it doesn't, that doesn't phase me. I've always handwritten everything from book one, two, and three. They were all written at the same time because I didn't know what I was doing. So I just sat down and started writing. And then I'd be like, oh, well, they're going to want to know how this character came to be. And I pick up another journal and start, start writing. So that's how I've always done it. Um, luckily, I have discovered a support system and other authors that I admire. And now I can talk to them. Uh, C.R. Rice is an author that I admire that's actually under the Four Horsemen umbrella who I've become close with. She writes uh, young adult fantasy and I love what she's doing with this nonlinear timeline and she's helped me out tremendously. So I've just discovered other authors that I talk to and now are lending support and that's been great. But yeah, I've made tremendous mistakes that you would just look at me and go, really, you did that? And I'm like, yeah, like, you know, you got to find a good editor. That's a big, it's a big thing I learned. Find a good editor. <laughs> find a really good one. Don't tell them you're dyslexic. Let them discover it on their own. Because if you tell them, <laughs> sometimes they're lazy and they don't think you'll notice things. But I have a great editor, and Christina Frey. She's my first editor who always goes through it. Cleet Barrett-Smith is my developmental editor. They get it before my publisher ever even gets it. I send it to an editor before my publisher even sees it for their editing department. And people are like, that seems like double the work. Yes, it does. I already made that mistake, thank you very much. We've learned, we move on. Double, triple, quadruple check things now. Cause I don't want people going, you know, I found a mistake on page 89. Do you think I read my own book? <laughs> uh, do you know how many times I've read this story in my head? I can repeat it. I did, you know, there's an X on page 12. Okay, I don't control the font. Hate to tell you this. Don't control it. Don't do the layout myself. So, you know, now triple check everything. There you go. It's I'm already on the cover. Okay, look, I write the book, create the characters. I'm on the cover. I'm out. There's only so much I could do, people. I'm out. Hey, it's a good thing if you ask me indeed, because hey, you get to be even more part of the story than ever when you actually physically write your stuff down and take, you get to edit as you go along after you're done writing all of it. Yes. I kind of joke that it's building the skeleton as I handwrite it. And then I put, when I go to the computer to edit a little more, it's like muscle on the bone kind of, you know, that's the next stage of editing. So I play that way and we see what happens. And sometimes it's great. And sometimes I'm like, what the heck was I thinking? I have a lot of those <laughs> moments too. Where I'm like, really? That's where we're going with it? Or I look at the page and I go, I can't even read what I wrote. Okay, we got to go in a different direction. And then I'll go back a couple of days later and go, oh, that's what I meant. Okay, now I'm, mm -hmm, got it. All right, now we got it. Okay, now I know where I was going. And then there's some days where to this day, I have no idea what I wrote. No clue. I'll look back at that page and I'm like, still don't know. Can't read it. And we move on. Oh, yeah. That's right, indeed. Definitely got to move on, indeed, because, yeah, you're right. It's like, oh, yeah, folks are pointing out the page. It's like, oh, yeah, the 89. The font's so bad here. What happened? And it's like, ah, 
Prime Team Press. Let's go with that. Exactly. It's like you triple track things, and then out of nowhere, it's that one typo that stays hidden in the shadows until someone else points it out after you walked right over with guys. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's happened. It's happened. <laughs> That's right indeed. That's right indeed. So my goodness, so what can folks expect from this series? And is there a part six in the works? Part six I was just working on today because it's due at my publisher in January. So yeah, part six is coming. There is no doubt. Part six will actually end volume one. But overall, the series, the series is uh, adult high fantasy, epic fantasy, sword and sorcery, dragons. If you love dragons, I got dragons for you. The series is based on the retelling of the origin of the Fae. I've taken it away from the normal Celtic beginnings and Fae being little. Fae actually stands for the Fellowship Aegis of Earth, the Defenders of the Earth. So these are angels who were locked out of heaven. So a group of them were sent to Earth to get it ready for the creator's next experiment, which are humans. And another group was actually off fighting the war against Lucifer. And both sects are unfortunately locked out of the shining kingdom they don't know why they just can't go home and so they're they're now stuck on earth and they're trying to figure out now what do they do they have no job which i think at one point we can all relate to that and they have no identity anymore and now their wings are decaying because they no longer have the shining glory flowing through their veins so what do they do and so they have to just start all over find new identities and live that way. But as they're here, they start thinking the other one had something to do with them possibly being locked out and a civil war between the two breaks out. But then humans come along and they figure out human worship equals power. Well, what do you want to do? Now you want to fight for that worship. And so we get to see from the beginning of time as it goes through and how the fae play into it. So you see them through the primitive human eyes as your pagan gods and goddesses, your Greek, your Roman, your Egyptian gods and goddesses, and how humanity builds and what they have to do, just the fae themselves to survive and find their own identities, which I think we can all kind of identify with. We've all been there when something major happens and we have to rebuild from it. But at the same time, you know, it's just a different point of view. You see it from the dark fae and the light fae's reactions. And the dark fae pick being dark fae just be simply because the light fae are like, we'll be the light fae. And they're like, fine, we'll be the dark fae. We're just going to do the opposite, whatever <laughs> you're going to do. We're going to go and be the opposite of just because we think you had something to do with it. And once again, I think we've all been in a fight with a friend that's done that, where it's like, I say light, you say dark. I say blue, you say white. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, that's what we're going to do. That's what they do. So you just get to see that kind of play back and forth. And then how it develops from there. And it takes us through the entire timeline. So volume one is literally from the beginning of time to about the 16th century. And then we have a time jump into volume two into the 21st century. And we get to shadow governments and CIA and all that good stuff. Oh, wow. Shit's about to get real then. (laughs) Extra real probably. (laughs) It's going to get real, real, real quick. It's going to get real, real. But for right now, we got a lot of political intrigue, all in which, once again, probably isn't all that unreal, you know what I'm saying right now? But it's, <laughs> it's all of that. It's a play on alternative history, all that good stuff. It's If you're a fan of, like, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, it's a little mix of, of that in the first volume. And then volume two, I like to say it's uh, Supernatural meets Homeland. So it's, you know, a little bit of everything for everybody. But I'm not a romance person. So if you're looking for those long romances, I have sparks of romance here and there. I've got a little enemies to lovers trope there. But if you're looking for that fey romance, no, I'm a little more action packed. I'm a little more, you know, we're going to stab some people through the heart kind of thing. I mean, look, I'm a martial artist. I'm going to have good fight scenes. That's kind of what I do. That's my thing. So I'm a little more on that side of it. I'm a little violent. Just warning you now. Okay, there's a lot of violence, but, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stabby stabby, okay? There's there's a lot of that. There's, you know, we, we might be gutting people here and there. Um, <laughs> here and there. Sorry. You know, might be some of that. Might, you know, and there's some dragons and things like that. So, yeah, I'm a, I can get a little violent. 
but once again, did you really expect anything less from a martial artist? No, you know, it's gonna happen, but there's magic. I got magic, I got magic going. You know, plasma balls getting thrown at each other. The novella is all dragon fighting. Okay, that one's violent. That one's violent, I'll warn you now. But you know, I don't curse. So, you know, there's a, there's a feather in my cap. <laughs> Other than that, you know, you know, I, like I said, don't read it to a two-year-old. There's your warning. <laughs> That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. Don't get distracted by the cover. Make sure you hide it. That's right, indeed. <laughs> Be like the Vatican. Try to ban it. Is the, did the Vatican succeed with that? Because I heard they tried to ban your books, <sighs> right? <laughs> Yeah, I might be on a couple blasphemy lists, which once again, still don't know how I got there. Um, I'm <laughs> on two blasphemy lists. I'm still working for that third. Still working for that third, because I feel like two is just not enough. You know, let's go for the even three. I'm on two blasphemy lists, and there was a group petitioning the Vatican to ban the book. I'd like to think the Vatican is busy with other things. I'd like to think so. Um. But once again, if the Pope wants a copy of the book, he can call me. He knows. I would think he knows where to find me. I don't know. Is he all knowing? I don't know. But you know, he can call me. I'll. I'll send. If maybe he likes an audio book better. It's on Audible. I can send it to him. I think I can gift it to him or something. I'm sure it's fine. But yes, there was a group that felt the book should be banned by the Vatican. The Vatican did not succeed or did not get their petition. I'm not sure how that works exactly. But as far as I know, I have not yet been excommunicated. I don't know. Maybe I get a letter. Do they send it certified? I don't. I don't know. Does it like? <laughs> does a bat drop it off? I'm not sure exactly how the official excommunication works. No one has explained the process yet to me. I'm waiting to find out. I, I like I said. I I don't know. I don't know who drops that off to me. But as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. But um, so far no. I just know I'm on the blasphemy lists. Uh, the death threats have calmed down for now every now and then they amp back up again because i don't know i don't know if i make it on a different list and somebody's like here we go again but you know it's usually the same i get a dm on instagram that says they want my home address because they're going to send me some pamphlets on how to make my uh, relationship with god better so they'd like my home address yep and my response is usually the same lucifer has not yet told me which realm of hell we will be living in once we are married but as soon as he does I will let you know. For now, we are registered at Bed Bath & Beyond. Please send towels. Hell has a surprisingly low amount. <laughs> and that's all I can tell you right now. Um, but, you know, and I have not yet decided if I'm taking his name or hyphenating it because, you know, I have my authorship to think about. So, you know, though Danielle Morningstar does have a nice ring to it, I have to say, and I think I might sell more books that way. Um, and I thought of changing my pen name to that. So, you know, I'm not sure, but that's where we're at with the blasphemy lists. And I keep joking that they're still on book one. Baby, you haven't even gotten a book four yet. And I do so much more damage in book four. Um, so, you know, <laughs> keep reading away. And once you get to book four, call me. And we'll, we'll see, you know, I'm thinking that'll get me on that third list. Fingers crossed. Because I really didn't set out to upset anybody. But for some reason, part one Red Sea and have the Fae be the people who do it. And look what happens. Everybody gets upset about that. So, I, you know, just wait till they get to book four in the chapter that's called the Jesus Factor. And let me tell you, then they're really going to lose their minds. So um, if you haven't picked up book four, go right ahead and see what happens. <laughs> Oh man, freaking gold! Because my goodness, when I heard that one of your past interviews, I'm like, the hell, like that exists, and why, like, dude, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> like that's crazy. It's it's like yeah. dude, it's a freaking novel. <laughs> it's a novel series. Like, relax. <laughs> that was my. That was my. I was like, how much? I, and the funny thing was, when I wrote it, I never thought this is going to be a problem. Like, I didn't think for two seconds that was going to be it i'm like maybe they'll have a problem thinking they were angels for like i was going through and my dad is very religious and i was like dad and he's like no he's like it's a novel like it's, it's a fantasy it's a big deal and i'm like yeah you're right and then over the summer the death threats came back in like really 
crazy death threats. And I was like, the, the book's been out for two years. Like, why are these rolling in now? And for some reason, somebody got, I don't know. And I was like, we're back. And I actually had to put out an Instagram story like, okay, you guys can threaten me with eternal damnation all you want. It's just going to get you laughed at. I'm like, when you start sending me pictures of you guys holding guns with a date under it, I'm like, that's where we're crossing a line here. Just a bit, people. I'm like, down a notch, down a notch, down a notch. I'm like, and then they started doing it after Salomon Rushdie was attacked. I got a couple more. And then some people went out on Goodreads and was like, this book, all religion should be appalled by this book. And and they were like the science behind it. I'm like, first of all, my science, I was like, hold on. I'm like, this is where flag on the play. I'm like, my science is sound. I was like, first of all, my science is sound. I was like, so you can be upset by a lot of things. But I'm like, as for my dragons, I worked with a veterinarian. I, I worked with a uh, physics professor, a mechanical engineer. No, my dragons are sound. I was like, as for the parting of the Red Sea, it was a water spout. Like, that's how I saw, I'm like, that is not all in outside of the realm of possibility. I'm like, it's a fantasy book. And they went off and they were like, and it was a call to arms and I reported it, but Goodreads was like, it's freedom of speech. I'm like, remember that. And then the next day I got an Instagram post of somebody holding a gun with a date under it, calling themselves the guns of God. And I'm like, whoa, okay. I'm like, how you doing? Good, mm -hmm. thank you. I'm like, and then somebody was outside my house taking a picture and I'm like, um, we're taking this a little seriously. It's, it's, it's a fantasy book, people. I'm like, so down a notch. It's a fantasy book. I'm like, just down a notch. So, uh, but I can't, what am I going to do? You know, at this point, so all I say is Bill Maher, call me. I would love to discuss this on you, on your show, um, because I don't know what else to say. And last time I checked and I, it's not that I'm not religious. I am. Um, but I don't believe the man in the cloud is golf clapping right now going, go get that little redheaded author guy. That's <laughs> being a good person. I don't think, I think that's the opposite of this whole religion thing. Now I could be wrong. I've read the Bible. I did actually go to a Christian college and last time I checked the Bible studies and maybe it's changed. I'm thinking the whole promoting violence is the exact opposite because I thought the only one who was allowed to smite people and all that was the man in the cloud. But maybe he's given that power to somebody else and I don't know about it. I didn't get the memo. Once again, could be the excommunication thing. Don't know. But if the Pope wants to call me and have a discussion, I'm open to the discussion. We can ride around in the Pope mobile with a cool little hat on our heads, have a good time. I'm open for it. Have some wine, have some cheese. We can talk a little bit. But, you know, if any smiting is going to be done, I thought it was supposed to come from a higher authority rather than a dude on Instagram. Could be wrong. Don't know. So I'm waiting for the rules. Like I said, register to Bed Bath Meet on, please send towels. <laughs> there you go that bed bath and beyond baby that's right indeed and the beyond part is real because my goodness it's like dude what the freaking hell because you're actually the first author to have this type of situation happened of this level because my goodness and it, do you think it's because you know, are you still catholic today because you're raised catholic right i was raised catholic i don't practice because <laughs> after this hell if anything didn't scare you this definitely would no, I don't practice. I'm not really into organized religion for various reasons. But, um, you know, I studied a lot of different religions before I came to any conclusions. My dad is still practicing. And, you know, I joke, don't bring the book into the church. <laughs> they, they might jump you. But no, I, I actually practice more Wiccan and, you know, other things. But I'm not, I'm not putting anybody's religion down by any means. If it works for you, good for you. Like, that's awesome. Do whatever works for you. What works for me works for me. That's, you know, how I see it. I've talked to other authors who have had some problems with things. I sometimes wonder if it's I'm a woman, you know, is, am I just an easier target? I don't know. You know, I just think there's a bit of an attack on freedom of speech at this point where people feel more emboldened also to hide behind a keyboard because they feel there's anonymity and they're allowed to just say what they want. But I'm kind of like... I'm still going to write. It's not going to scare me. I'm writing a fantasy novel about fairies, for God's sake. This is not attacking the, you know, archetypes of religion. 
you know, I'm trying to just give people out there an escape and make them feel good. And I know I've done that because I've heard from my readers. So if just a couple loudmouths want to come at me, okay, what are you going to do? Because trust me, if you were standing in front of me, I highly doubt you would be half as boisterous as you are. Real easy behind a keyboard. So I'm really not worried. I get to wear a crown every day. What do you get to do? I'm good. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, I'm talking about indeed. I'm talking about indeed. So indeed. Well, hey, as they say, <laughs> setbacks are really a setup for it. And besides, anybody would come after a world champion martial artist who could probably literally break concrete with hands and feet. Like, ah, oh, good luck to them. Because <laughs> they're going to freaking beat it. <laughs> and to be put in the mental institution for their stupidity. <laughs> I'm really not worried. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. So no problem. <laughs> that's right y'all that's right indeed just stick to the regular negative comments avoid the death threats because it's way too serious you're taking it way too seriously over a freaking fantasy novel <laughs> so my goodness so if you're oh wait a second that ain't the question yet so since you've been on a boatload of podcasts is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often i think it's funny that you know speaking of this religious thing a lot of times people don't even ask me if i am religious or you know what was my upbringing it's kind of funny they just assume i'm not religious or i have no spirituality i find that to be you know kind of funny that they just assume i'm an atheist and it's like no i'm actually not you know i do have a sense of spirituality so i kind of find that amusing that you know it's just assumed i'm not that's right, Dave, you said Wiccan earlier, right? <laughs> I've done some Wiccan, yeah. I've, I've actually followed the Wiccan path for a while, which is why there's a lot of spells in the book, and they stay true to the Wiccan path and why the, uh, the Fae do as well in the book is because I've studied that for a long time, and I do find uh, I identify with that more because I feel like it's more authentic. Uh, in a land where authenticity is on high demand, that's right, indeed. So my goodness, so if your whole entire novel series, The Birth of Faye, if it was a food, what would it be and why? Um, oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think it would probably be something kind of exotic or, or fruit of some well, I'd want it to be chocolate because God knows I love chocolate. But I don't know, maybe it would be something kind of cool like you know what it would be a Reese's peanut butter cup that's was what it would be because I think deep down everybody loves a Reese's peanut butter cup but then there are, it has to be at the right time and you have to be in the mood for it and I think that's kind of my book it's got all the makings of something great and it's two things coming together that you love but you have to be in the mood for it so I, I, I don't like when authors are like, oh, my book's for everybody when it's really not. So I think it'd be a Reese's Peanut Butter <laughs> Cup because you have to be in the mood for it. But it's still two great elements. Uh, that's right, indeed. Two great elements, indeed. <laughs> that's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. Funny enough, you're the first one to refer to their books as a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. <laughs> I like to be original. <laughs> there you go you can't spell or see you know without original <laughs> that's right indeed. That's there right. you go nice <laughs> that's right indeed it ain't just your average Reese's cup either it's a big cup that's right indeed it's a whole box of Reese's big cups that's right indeed that's right indeed so by goodness by goodness coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive and that is if you're gonna wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again but you're still in the current year with all of your knowledge and experience what advice would you give to yourself don't take things so seriously and believe in yourself self-confidence because i was definitely lacking it at 25 that would be my major major piece of advice is Believe in yourself, have a little more self-confidence, and everything's going to be okay. Just breathe. Just take a step back, enjoy where you're at, and breathe. It's going to go by so quick that you're not even going to know. Oh, yeah, that's right, indeed. 
Yeah, you can say that again about this speed. You freaking right. My goodness, like, dude. <laughs> Rick and Tom needs to take a smoke yeah. break sometimes, a long one. <laughs> yeah, like I turned around and I was like, I'm how old? What the heck just happened? Like I was looking around literally like when did when did all this happen? What? <laughs> what huh i was just saying this with my friend jen i'm still friends with her I, she looked at me the other day and she was like when, when did we become this she's like what weren't we just like at a bar i was like yeah i i don't know when this happened so I, yeah it would just be stop and look around and breathe stop like worrying about getting to the next step the next stop the next level you'll get there just chill out that would be my big thing that's right indeed. That's right indeed. Chill on out. That's right indeed. Be cool than two cucumbers and wear a tr. Better yet, wear a crown. That's right indeed. Yeah, that's right indeed. The yeah. crown of chillness. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, that's right indeed. So for those who need to surround the crown and keep up with your journey, what's the best way? For folks to do so, especially when it comes to buying a bunch of copies, if not a boatload of copies of your marvelous books and sharing them with others. Oh, shameless self-promotion. I love. You can find me at birthofthefay.com or on Instagram at birthofthefay, F-A-E underscore novel. And that's the best place to keep up with all things Faye is Instagram. But if you want to go buy a copy, and I so hope you do, you can find me at barnesandnobles.com, target.com bookshop.org which i encourage everybody to do because then you a portion of your uh purchase actually goes to smaller mom and pop bookstores and helps them out uh, another great place if you kind of want to try before you buy is bookie call and bookie call is this little app where you can find your next great book date and locked out of heaven is on bookie call it's for ios and android and you can kind of scroll through and see what it would be like to date locked out of heaven kind of like date it before you put a ring on it and see what you know it's all about but bookie call i think is a really great way to kind of try me out first and find out what a little first date with uh, locked out of heaven would be like and then you'll get your answer on what kind of what food birth of the fae is like because i think that's on there or what kind of wine is like those questions might be on there so you could check out my dating profile on bookie call uh that's right indeed i'm so glad you met your bookie call because i forgot about that we actually had the uh I think he's I think he's the founder or the co-owner of Bookie called Jim Knight. He actually was on the show. <laughs> My God, episode 370 now to think about it. Yeah, good dude rocking out, helping out fellow authors. So now we got a happy app customer on the app. That's right indeed. You get the trap before you buy it. That's right indeed. That's right indeed. And the good news is when you put a ring on this one, it's not gonna cost you half your money. <laughs> exactly. You see? And you can think about, it. you can get me on ebook, you get a hardback, a paperback, or the audible. So I'm not going to cost you all that much, even though I wear a tiara. You see? So it's not so bad. I'm good like that. That's right, indeed. She's good with 10 O's, indeed. She's good. <laughs> it's the Faye you're yeah. good for. <laughs> that's right indeed the fay baby that's right indeed <laughs> it ain't just about dre day it's fay day <laughs> it's fay day it's not friday it's fay day that's right indeed so you heard that right folks check all all of danielle's goods that's right all the marvelous books indeed on all those wonderful places i'm gonna put a link to the wonderful site in the show notes that way you can keep in contact with her and be able to look out for her future novels indeed and she might even be back when it's time to promote that new wonderful book to start the new volume with the birth of faith that's right indeed that's right indeed we're in the modern day where the pyramids finally get their due we finally get to open that fifth eye that's right that's right indeed maybe that seventh eye that's right be a whole cyclops and a half maybe that's right <laughs> even though was, that math is way off i love that <laughs> that's okay they don't do math it's good it's all good <laughs> oh sweet there we go Faye don't do math baby that's right indeed that's a saying a slogan somewhere and somewhere but hey it's so good it's all good indeed it's all good <laughs> well before any more rabbit holes appear any parting words before we close up shop danielle i just want to say thank you and for everybody to just you know check out the Faye. 
I like to think of myself as your gateway drug into the fantasy world. My bit, my books are not three, 400 pages. I'm more of a anywhere from 160 to 260 page book. So you don't have to be intimidated by fantasy, which I know is kind of a stigma in fantasy. I, I'm not one of those big, big books where you're like, oh my God, I have to actually sit here and read it. I'm not like that. So, and you don't have to wait 10 years for my books to come out. I try to give them to you so you're not like waiting on the edge where you're like, oh, she ended on a cliffhanger and now I got to wait a year. I'm not going to, I will end on a cliffhanger. I'll be honest with you. I will end on a cliffhanger, but I won't keep you waiting that long. So, you know, and I will always leave you with a little note at the end of the book to kind of tell you what's coming next. I'm good like that. So, you know, you can, I'm gentle with my readers. I will crush your heart and your soul, but I won't leave you waiting too long when I do it. I'm going to do that. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to do that. But at least you know what you get yourself into. So it's not so bad. Thanks a bunch for tuning in and setting aside some of your time to listen to this wonderful podcast, Going North. If you really enjoyed what you heard, do me a solid and share this with your network and someone that you care about that would get something out of it too. And be sure to subscribe to hear more. And heck, even check out the backlog if you would like because there are hundreds of episodes to choose from. And they just keep getting better and not butter.